Can you just explain um, why Richard III is so important as a historical figure? It's something of an enigma, what happened to him, and obviously the issue with the, uh, his nephews and what happened there. Well, I think the thing about Richard III is that he's really been kept in, in historical awareness by Shakespeare, who was maybe not particularly fair to him. Mm. Um, and there is this enduring mystery with Richard about whether he was responsible for the demise of his nephews for whom he was supposed to be a protector but who disappeared in the tower Um, and also given that he died in battle that's something that that tends to get people's imaginations going and also this this Shakespearean rumour that he was hunchbacked Mm. so there's been a historical to and fro about whether the Shakespearean view of Richard as an evil hunchback is correct or the view of him as a normal and nice individual. And it might actually be that it's not quite either of those two things. How did the team obtain um, any hints of the possible location of the body? Um, what, what, what sort of sparked off the whole project? Well, the project really was brought into being by the Richard III Society, and particularly yes. by Philippa Langley. Yeah. Um, and they were very keen to go and investigate the area of the Greyfriars Priory in Leicester because um, there's historical evidence that that's where Richard III was buried. Right. Now, after the Reformation, the Priory buildings were the Priory buildings were, were taken down and the stone and a lot of it reused elsewhere. Yes. So the precise location of it had been lost. Right. Um, I think there's an 18th century map. It might even be 19th century. That 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 gives enough about the location of where the Ferrari had been that right. we knew it was roughly in that area. Okay. Um, there are a lot of standing buildings in that area. We obviously can't excavate underneath any of those. Yes. So the area of the car park was, was the place that we had to look. And it was actually Richard Buckley of ULAS that came up with the strategy right. for the excavation, which was roughly that most ecclesiastical buildings have an east-west orientation. Yes, yes. Um, so thereby, if you want to find an ecclesiastical building and you're not quite sure where it is, the best thing to do is to put in a series of north-south trenches. Yes, I um, So that's, that was really what the project set out to do, is to, to locate the buildings associated with the Friaria and go from there. And in a way, the fact that we came down on what seems to have been exactly the right place was, was more luck than anything else. We had a very good chance of picking up the, the church buildings, but we didn't have such a good chance of, of finding the right skeleton. Okay. Um, So can you describe to us the moment when the team uncovered the body? Um, Was there anything remarkable? Did you realise what you found? Well, we excavated... The the skeleton was found very early on during the dig. Hmm. Um, But I actually was out of Leicester, so we didn't fully uncover it. We just uncovered a a small area of the legs. And when I came back, we had to excavate a little bit of a larger extension to the trench because it was going under the wall and then work our way down to it. And then the skeleton itself was excavated over a whole day. Right. Um, the skull was sitting much higher than the rest of the body and for that reason when we first came to it we thought it might not be attached to the body that we had the legs of. Um, but when I lifted the skull I could see that there were some injuries to it. So that set a few alarm bells ringing. Mm. Um, I then excavated most of the rest of the skeleton and actually that looked completely normal. It was only at the very end when I came to, to excavate the rib cage and the vertebral column that I realised that there were some abnormalities. Mm. We found this um, condition called scoliosis in the spine which is a severe curvature off to one side. Um, and then at the very end of that process, when we were lifting out the, the vertebrae, I actually found underneath it a small piece of, of corroded iron, which turned out subsequently to be some kind of an arrowhead. Um, so it wasn't really right until right at the end of the excavation process that we realised that, that this was likely to be the right one. Right. Um, so, we, I mean, obviously it's created a lot of media attention and... Um, it's very exciting. Uh, were you hopeful from the outset? I mean, you said um, you didn't even know you'd, you'd find much of the church, let alone a body. So um, it, from the outside, it, it looked sort of miraculous almost. Yes, I was very unhopeful that we would find anything. And in fact, when Richard Buckley came to talk to me about the project in the first place, he said if we found him, he'd eat his hat. So um, he may be doing a bit of hat eating quite soon now. And yes, I mean, there, we thought that we might find the church. Um, and if we did, it was feasible that we'd find human remains because burials do occur inside churches. But the the idea that we'd find the right set, mm. I felt, was very unlikely indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's quite rare, watch enough time team to realise it's quite rare to find anything that substantial. Um, 
and um, sort of complete an archaeological dig. So it must have been quite exciting to find anything, let alone something. Yes, I think when you put a trench into an urban area like this, and Leicester Mm. has 2,000 years' worth of history, you know you're going to hit something, even if Mm. it's only 19th century wall foundations, and we found Mm. a few of those too. Um, So we always knew that there was going to be archaeological material under there, but we weren't quite prepared for what we found. Sure. Um, So... uh, what are the biggest questions now that you need to answer? I mean, obviously, studying the skeleton, predominantly the media interest is in whether or not it's Richard III, mm-hmm. but presumably there's an archaeological interest in any skeleton you would have found. Yes, absolutely. And, of course, the DNA analysis is a major component of the research. Um, and in the first instance, we'll be looking at the mitochondrial DNA, which is passed down through the female line exclusively. And we have a modern descendant through the female line exclusively, which means that hopefully we'll be able to match that up, assuming that our family trees are right and assuming that there's no contamination or various other caveats. Um, but then from the point of view of the skeleton, there's a lot that we can do. I, I said that there are some head injuries hmm. on, on the skull. And... We can analyse those and we can see what kind of things they were caused by. Mm. Uh, We can see how severe they were. Uh, We can look at the spinal curvature, the scoliosis, and we can learn a little bit about the condition that gave rise to that. So that can be caused by a number of different reasons and we'll hopefully be able to learn a bit more about that. Um, I still have to properly age the skeleton. I can see from what I've seen so far that it's an adult male Mm. and that it's not an elderly adult male, but we Mm. can hopefully bring down... um, the, the age of the individual, hopefully to around about 32. Um, we'll also carbon date it. Yeah. We're planning to carry out facial reconstruction on it. Um, we'd like to carry out chemical analysis of the bones, and that will enable us to see um, whereabouts this person was living both during their childhood, and we can tell that by looking at the chemicals in the teeth and later on towards their death, which we can do by looking at chemicals in the bone. So we're doing lots of different sorts of tests on it. Yeah, I'd range. Um, Will you be able to find out sort of the cause of death, as it were? I know it sounds a bit csi <laughs> but um, you said there was an arrow head injury. Um, there are a series of injuries on the skeleton, and it's quite likely that any one of those could have been fatal. Right. So we'll look into those in a lot more detail to try mm. and understand more about them, but there's a good chance that we won't be able to say which one specifically caused death because any unhealed injury that doesn't overlap, you don't have anything to tell you which order it happened in. If you get two right. injuries and one's overlying the other, then that shows mm. you, obviously, that the overlying one happened later. But we don't have that. We have injuries to discrete areas of the skeleton. So okay. yeah. we'll probably never know which one exactly was the fatal blow. Yeah. Um, so you said there's a lot of tests chemical tests for the teeth and such. Would these have been possible sort of 10, 20 years ago? What technological advances um, have, have made this sort of kind of study possible? Well, DNA research in particular is moving on all the time and it's yeah. becoming um, much more feasible to extract DNA from archaeological skeletons. I mean, it's been going on for a while and I think the first work on Neanderthal DNA was published in 1997. So, you know, this is an ongoing thing, but, but yes, techniques are coming on all the while, and DNA is obviously very significant for Leicester, seeing as we're the birthplace of DNA fingerprinting. Um, but also the other methods, um, isotopic research, again, has been going on for quite a lot of time, but methods are always improving. Mm-hmm. Um, carbon dating, we can now use much smaller samples than we used to, which is great because it involves very little destruction of the bone. You can do it with just a few grams, so you hardly even notice it's gone now. Um, so, so yes, it's not necessarily that the techniques are completely new in the last few years, but they're moving on all the time. Looking, I mean, you're saying they're moving on. Um, obviously, the Richard III Society are hoping there's going to be a renewed interest. Um, but what do you think the sort of right, wider research will lead from this in the next decade and decade or so? Um, do you think there'll be researchers sort of pursuing this skeleton, in, um, or, or what has led from this discovery? Um, well, I think that this skeleton itself will be reburied. There seems to be a, right, yeah. a, a, a large amount of a public opinion in favour of that, and yeah. we're looking into options for that at the moment. So the skeleton itself won't be around for analysis. No. Um, and we hope that we'll do a very thorough analysis at the moment, so we'll get all the information that we need to out of it. Right. What we probably will be able to do in the future is to do a lot more research on the Greyfriars buildings themselves, mm. and that actually is, is something very significant too. Um, this is a major monastic complex in Leicester that we don't really know terribly much about at the moment. So for the local area, that could itself be quite significant. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I'm sure you're not in charge of that, but do you think that they'll um, sort of get rid of that car park and have it as an archaeological site like the um, jury wall? The answer is I really don't know. Now, social services are using it as their car park for their child protection right, services okay. at the moment, and I assume that they're still going to need to park their cars. So it really depends on whether the council wants to reorganise and move things around so mm. that that's possible to keep it open to the public. Mm. They've certainly refilled the, the dig at the moment, and actually there's not a lot left to look at. Most of the walls, for example, have had the stone removed, so that you just see the trenches work that the stones come out of rather than the walls themselves. So it's not, it's not spectacular. Okay. Um, I suspect that there'll be museum exhibitions put on within the city. So you mentioned um, the possibility of the bod skeleton being reburied. Um, does that depend on it being identified as Richard III? I mean, if it's not him, what happens to the skeleton? Well, the answer is that we'll probably never to be, be able to prove absolutely for certain that it isn't Richard III. If we don't get a DNA match, then that could be because we've got the wrong skeleton, or it equally could be because there's a problem with the genealogical tree that we've got. Um, which we're trying to check up on at the moment and also to identify other descendants who might be of help to us. Um, so the two options at the moment are really probably against not proven. Um, right. Now, I think it's a condition of our exhumation licence that these particular remains will be reburied, so I think mm. they'll be reburied whatever happens. Mm. But obviously the circumstances of that reburial might vary according to the strength of of our idea of whether it's Richard III or not. Okay. I mean, are there any ethical issues in um, an excavation? I mean, obviously, whether it is or isn't him, this person was buried a very long mm -hmm. time ago. Um, but, I mean, I know, for instance, in America, the Native American Indians have issues with their um, ancestors being uh, uh, um, excavated for research. Yeah. Um, so do in general, or in this excavation, has there been any issues with that? It's quite, I mean, the ethics of, of excavation human remains are quite complicated. Mm. Um, and we do actually follow ethical guidelines, mm. um, which are produced by the um, National Association of, of Osteologists, known as the BAO, it's a complicated set of initials. Um, now, those don't require reburial, and in fact, they're very specific about the fact that in many cases, reburial is not the option we want to go for. And mm. that's because with most individuals, you won't analyse a skeleton and then you'll be done. You'll of there'll often be different research questions that come up in the future or new techniques that are developed. And if that skeletal material is being reburied, then it's not available for research. Um, we also, in this country, don't have so much of a tradition of being worried about bodies. I think we are actually more worried now than we've been at any point in the past. And at the point when Richard III died, um, bodies were, were regularly dug up and actually regularly displayed. So if we think mm. of relics of saints, for example, they were often on display in churches. And a lot of churches actually had charnel chapels, mm. whereby burials that had been disturbed had material placed into those. And those were designed to be accessible, so you could actually see this material. So we don't have the same idea about seeing bits of dead bodies being, being a problem as, as Native American societies, for example, would have. Right. Um, could you sort of describe your role specifically in the, in the Richard III uh, project? Well, basically, I'm a human osteologist, so mm. I do all those things that are directly to do with the analysis of the bones. Okay. And that meant excavating the skeleton, it will mean cleaning the skeleton, and it will then mean being in charge of the analysis, some of which I'll do myself and some of which will bring in spe specialists from outside to assist with. Okay. Um, so, could you just explain um, to people who, who um, aren't familiar what an osteologist actually is? I mean, presumably a bone person, but um, in, in layman's terms, what exactly is your, your job? Um, My job is that I study um, skeletonised human remains from the past, right. and I do that not for fun, but because it can tell us a lot about the past. It can yes. tell us a lot about how people lived. Um, the kinds of diseases that they suffered from, what their nutritional status was like. It can tell us about society's attitudes to the body. It can tell us about things like whether there were differences between um, the lives of men and women, whether there were differences between the lives of rich and poor. We can use it to trace the development of particular disease processes. There are a lot of things that human remains can, can help us to understand in the past. Yeah. And sometimes they're even relevant for, for, for life today, especially when it comes to disease processes. Okay. Um, part of your research um, is on burials and social meaning, as you've just mm -hmm. said, about what 
bones can tell us and what the way bones are buried. Um, what can you learn about where possible Richard um, was from the placement and the location of the skeletons of the choir? Um, is that significant? And if so, why? Well, the choir is a fairly prestigious location within the church. But interestingly, the burial itself is not very complex. Mm. So there was no coffin associated with it. Um, unfortunately, the floor of that part of the church had been truncated probably in the 19th century, so we mm. can't tell whether there was a monument over it originally. Um, but the actual grave itself is very simple, and we can tell from the position of the bones, they haven't really moved at all around at all um, after burial, which suggests that they were buried in a shroud rather than a coffin because in a coffin you get empty space and that means as the body decays then bones can fall around so they okay. tend to disarrange themselves so we can tell that it was a very simple burial but it seems to have been a perfectly respectful one hmm. Would that fit with what historical sources suggest about Richard III's burial? Or, um... Well there's nothing to suggest that it was a particularly elaborate affair and of course you have to bear in mind that this is a, a king who just died in battle and hmm. that Henry Tudor presumably would not have wanted his burial place to have become a major spot for pilgrimage, so yeah. it, that lack of elaboration would fit in with that idea. Okay. Um, and sort of talking more specifically about you, I mean, what attracted you originally to studying uh, archaeology and osteology? And I'm one of those strange people who's wanted to be an archaeologist since I was quite little. Oh. I always loved going to museums as a child, and I loved to see archaeology on the TV, and it just it just fascinated me from the off. I didn't get out enough, I suspect. <laughs> um, so I've, I've really been following it single-mindedly for a while, and I first got into into Bones as an undergraduate, just, right. just working on basic undergraduate courses, and I really loved it, so that was why I then went on to do a Master's and have been carrying on with that ever since. Right. Um, Yeah, um, the, the sort of, um, obviously from, uh, as an archaeologist, um, it's a slightly different perspective, but from the outside, um, there's been a huge amount of attention from the media. Do you think um, that will affect future research, particularly in Leicester University? Do you think that will inspire people maybe to take up archaeology who hadn't before? Um, I hope so. We've certainly seen a, an increase in people inquiring about our courses since this news came out. Um, and I know there's been a big influx of people to, to Leicester to see the exhibition in the Guildhall and to come to the open day. So it's very encouraging in that sense. You know, we really like to, to encourage people to be interested in archaeology and to come and find out what it's all about. And so, yes, I think it's probably going to do the university quite a lot of good. Yeah. Um, I mean, would you have any sort of advice for someone and who was looking to study archaeology at Leicester, or just in general study archaeology? Um... Well, there are certain things that you can do to uh, to help you get into it. I don't think you need to worry too much about subject choices at A-level, because we're quite flexible about that sort of that's thing, okay, yeah. um, because archaeology is a wide-ranging discipline, and that's one of the nice things about it. Um, Try to get some experience. Go and vo volunteer on a site. Go and see if you can volunteer with a museum. Go and visit museums. When you're applying to universities, if you can show evidence mm. of your interest, then that's going to catch people's eyes. Okay. Um, and obviously, this is one of the sort of his, possibly um, one of the historical discoveries of, you know, uh, well, in a very long time, anyway. Um, but, I mean, is, is this sort of the kind of dream project to be working on, or do you have a, a dream project that would...? Um... The honest answer is actually no. It's been very exciting, um, but archaeology is not really about looking for named historical individuals. Right. Yeah, and what I love most about archaeology is using it to put together something complex that can tell us about societies in the past. So the work that I'll be doing in Russia which is looking at Bronze Age burial mounds, is, is going to be putting together, looking at burial practice, um, looking at evidence for health and disease on the bones, looking at the kinds of things that people were buried with, um, looking at how that relates to the settlement evidence that we have, which gives us a much more complete picture of a society, and that's what really excites me about archaeology, it's that being able to bring the past alive. 